We are uh, hosting today uh, Dr. Christina Popper from uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. So Christina Popper is a tenure track faculty of computer science at uh, New York University Abu Dhabi, where she is heading the cybersecurity and privacy uh, CPS lab. She is deputy program head of computer science and director of research at the center uh, CCSAD, so Center for Cybersecurity at NYU here, as well as global network assistant professor of computer science at the uh, current Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU. So Christina's research interest is cybersecurity and privacy. Focus areas are wireless and communication security, including cellular network security, secure localization, and aviation security, as well as privacy and uh, anonymity in communication networks. Uh, Christina has been a member of steering committee of ACM YSEC, the ACM conference on security and privacy in wireless and mobile networks since 2018, and was a TPC co-chair in 2018 and general chair in 2021. The research work of her group has been recognized by the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Program of uh, GCSMA, the GSM Association, and since 2021, she has been a member of the Executive Committee uh, of ACM SIG uh, SAC. Uh, in an earlier life, Christina worked at the European Space Agency in Paris, Space Rocks, and Christina holds her PhD and graduate degrees in computer science from uh, ETH Zurich. So the talk is yours. Welcome again. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. I think, I, will keep it here. Have, uh, I think my microphone should work. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much for this, uh, for this comprehensive introduction. <laughs> it's a big pleasure for me to be here today. It's, the first time, it's my first visit to TII. I've had a number of interactions with um, different members from TII, um, and we've met at different occasions at different places, but it's the first time that I actually visited visit your, your offices here, so that's, um, that's nice. Um, I would like to talk about um, some of our security research works that we did during the last years. Um, this is going to be mainly like an, an overview of topic. So I will talk, I will address different areas that we are working on. Um, I'll try to make it, I try to make it a bit inspirational as well. So looking forward as well, what might come in the future for some of those aspects. I will go uh, into some topics in a little bit more detail, but it's not really a technical conference like presentation or something. So there, there will be, I, I will be go, going over um, a number of, of, of technical details that, that I won't address here. Okay. So um, let me start. We, we had a, a pretty broad introduction already, so I can go over that um, kind of quickly. What I would like to mention is, so I'm, I'm leading the cybersecurity and privacy lab um, in my Abu Dhabi, and uh, I um, from since my PhD times, I've, I've focused on cybersecurity and on wireless security. During the last eight years, I've increasingly gotten interested in mobile and cellular security. So that's one um, one big pillar of, of the research work that we do, and that will also be reflected in the talk that I'm giving. So I will focus on three different areas in my talk today. The first one is exactly this mobile cellular network security um, that I will be talking about. The second topic is uh, secure localization and uh, security in aviation, aviation security. And the third one is, um, is a bit of a broader topic in terms of anonymity and privacy. So we, we address a number of different things. Um, for example, aspects of tours, so anonymous networks and how you can do traffic analysis attacks, uh, things like that. But I would, what I will focus on today is, is a, um, a small, a small or a nice recent uh, example of the research work that goes into the security of, of, um, of messengers, of today's messengers that we are using. Okay. Um, so let me start um, with the first part on mobile network security. When we look at the um, the generations over oh, generations over time, I'm coming there in a moment. When we look at the the cellular networks nowadays, how they look like, and the, the the abbreviations or terms that I will be using, with user equipment that is um, it, with wireless connections connected to a, to radio networks. So those are the base stations here with different terminology. So that's for um, uh, the G node Bs. GNB is for for five G networks. Was eNode bs before ENB and, and, for, and 4G communication. And then we have behind that um, the core network here with different aspects. That's all the core network that then connects to the internet. Um, that's kind of a, the rough idea of this, of this infrastructure in terms of having these connection points and in terms of having user equipment connecting to wireless base stations that are then connected to some form of um, a core network behind that. That's been um, in, in place for the mobile network generations basically almost since the 
since, since the beginning, almost, I say, it was a bit different um, when we look at 1G, uh, so the first generation mobile networks that, um, that were based on, on analog communication, so didn't use digital communication. Um, but as soon as we talk about uh, 2G, SMS, and digital communication started, with 3G, we saw the first web applications coming up and some form of widespread um, mobile um, um, network usage. 4G, we had widespread mobile applications, uh, or we are having them nowadays still with, with widespread uh, a wide bandwidth that allows a lot of different applications to be run over those networks. We're now here at the, at the 5G level um, that uh, are increasingly being set up, not all of them, are fully uh, on the full 5G capabilities. Some are in some um, transmission mode or transition mode between 4G and 5G. And we are heading then towards uh, 6G by the year 2030, more or less. So that's, that will enable a lot of, a lot of other new um, um, application scenarios. Okay, Andre doesn't work. Okay. Um, now, in terms of security aspects, what is it that, uh, that mattered during those timings? And I wanted to go through that shortly. If it comes, yes, it comes. Um, so uh, let me let me jump quickly over the the analogs for systems. This was audio only and uh, without basically any security or privacy guarantees. So we are quick there. It started to become more interesting with with two G, where first um, one way authentication was introduced, meaning that mobile devices would authenticate towards the network, but the network didn't authenticate towards the users. So it was very simple for an attacker to actually uh, build up a connection with, with users claiming to be the real network. And there were other aspects like, like weak encryption algorithms that were in use and so on. With 3G, what we've seen more are first like viruses, malware coming up. Um, it went on to, to go over to IP traffic. So the typical IP traffic vulnerabilities that we see in other networks as well is what came up. There were some encryption key um, issues. Now, what started to be interesting from my side was this is the 4G vulnerabilities, basically, because this was the time when we started to go into the research, security research for, for wireless, uh, for mobile networks. Um, and there are a number of, of vulnerabilities that we have, that we and other groups have discovered over the years. Um, one example is um, missing integrity protection for the user plane traffic. So there are two planes, the control plane messages that organize the setup of, of calls and signaling, and then the user traffic basically. And there's been missing integrity protection for the user plane traffic. Um, also user tracking has been one big issue in, in 4G networks because the, the identifiers, although they were temporary, it was still possible to track users um, following basically where their identifiers went. Now with 5G, a number of new things have come up. I think as a research community, we are still figuring out uh, a number of like the, the, the topics um, for 5G security research. Very likely that's gonna have to do with vulnerabilities in, in the new um, um, kind of the, the service network, the new services that are being off offered with SDNs, with cloud techniques. So the interactions from the 5G systems um, with, with those, also the openness of the network that would allow, so it's not a, a limited infrastructure anymore, but it would allow others to join in basically to offer services is something that can be expected to create um, vulnerabilities. And when we think about 6G, then um, we can only speculate at that time, but very likely topics like intelligent radios and their security, as well as um, we can expect that increasingly they will rely on AI-based technique, machine learning AI for optimizing the system. So all the attacks that are possible on AI systems are likely to, um, to occur there as well. I will, I will come to that in a little bit more detail. Um, now, when we look at um, the, the sphere, of, um, we can look at it in a way that, on one hand, uh, these mobile networks concern specifications. So that's then uh, about the specification and standardization bodies like 3GPP that define the documents and the, the specification, basically, that are then realized and implemented by manufacturers and the devices. Um, and then we have um, the actual deployment of those systems, um, and those are then like the the usual suspect like Salat and Do here in the UAE that are offering those services at the end. And we look at, at weaknesses or vulnerabilities on, on all of these stages. Um, just to mention these, these specification documents, so just the, the, not the entire architecture itself, but just the security um, specification of 
um, like the, the, the current 5G systems, this is typically a few hundred pages, only the security specification. So it's a, um, a reasonably complex system to look at and to get right. Um, in terms of research contributions, um, we try to, like, as I mentioned, uh, look into different aspects here. Um, we started off with specification issues and attacks that we called um, alter attacks. Um, I will come to some more details there, but basically it allowed to break um, into the missing or to misuse the missing integrity protection that I mentioned for the user brain traffic. Um, and we were able to um, basically um, impersonate users by setting. So an attacker could take over and a connection and impersonate um, users by those in, in 4G networks. Um, we looked at call issues. So when you use voice over LTE, they are encrypted. Um, and we found some weaknesses um, by reuse of, um, of, of counters and um, uh, cryptographic material. It was possible to basically XOR again. So you have extra operations for, for realizing the encryptions. And for redoing those operations, we were able to, to de-encrypt uh, calls that, that we were not supposed as an outsider to decrypt. Um, and, and this is to a large extent due to, to implementation um, issues, how, how this was realized, not necessarily due to the specification. And we looked at deployment issues. Um, how, how are the systems, the, the networks really um, realized? How are they deployed? Which configurations set up and what are possible vulnerabilities? In terms of 5G, we went over to analyze um, vulnerabilities in certain parts of the entire infrastructure. We particularly looked at the handover structure and um, the, the latest recent work was on the warning and emergency systems. And we showed how an attacker could actually impact those systems, introducing false warnings or and making sure that users uh, do not get warnings that are being sent out via cellular networks. And we try to understand what, what attackers can do. Um, we also like, as a general thing, everything that's in blue here has some security testing aspects. So um, that's we are practically oriented as a group. So we, we, we test so the security testing for, for devices um, is, is, is a current topic as well that, that we are looking into. Um, there are a number of different security requirements. I want to point out um, one of those aspects, which is identity and lo location privacy. So knowing where users are, or it should not be basically public knowledge when you use your mobile phone where you are, right? That's an aspect that I will, um, that I will go into a little bit more detail when I explain one of the, the research results. And then there are some, some other uh, security requirements like mutual authentication between the user equipment and the mobile state, um, the, the base stations, um, traffic confidentiality, so that everything is encrypted, cannot be decrypted, things like that. Um, in terms of enhancements, when we look at what happened from 4G to 5G, so the networks Made, made massive improvements in terms of, of bandwidth that, that 5G offers more than 4G uh, latency reductions, but also security made large steps forward. And some of those aspects I wanted to emphasize is one, one part is this confidentiality and integrity protection that I mentioned where um, on the user plane for 4G, we didn't have integrity protection. That's now, so the support for it is now mandatory. It's not necessarily clear that it's also oper in operational state, but at least the systems need to support it in general, um, which means that some of those attacks that we showed, showed for 4G, um, like the ultra attack, mm -hmm. if that's properly implemented and properly uh, realized and operational, then those attacks are not possible anymore, which is good for the security of the, of the network in general. Um, some other aspects like subscriber privacy and, and um, localization, um, these Identifiers that I mentioned before, that um, these, these SUPIs, so temporarily identifiers of users, were sent in plain text. This was changed now in 5G. They are now encrypted in something that's called sushi. I come to that. Um, and in general, this does not allow IMC catching anymore. So IMC catcher, where, you, where an attacker would try to connect to a device and then track that, for example. In general, that's not possible anymore, but one um, one, one restriction here already, or one addition, I would add that large scale MC catching is not possible anymore. And I will refine within a few slides what I mean by that. Why is it only that large scale MC catching is no longer possible? Um, threat landscape, just a short look. So net, these networks are huge and attackers can be on all parts of the network, starting from the user equipment or the, the connection from the user phones to, to the mobile base stations, 
um, also like other systems that are using mobile um, uh, mobile communications, we can have them in the system, we can have them in um, in the core network. So it depends on how, how we look at that, what we assume is reasonable to assume or not. Um, having an attacker here is something that's clearly possible because that doesn't require any insider knowledge. Everybody can listen in to, to communication that's going on because the, the wireless medium is open and shared. So everybody can basically um, con collect signals that are being sent. If they can be decrypted or not, it's a different question, but um, listening on is, is always possible. Um, and here just to mention that um, in terms of attacks, so I mentioned these MC catchers where an attacker would um, try to build up um, a connection to a mobile phone and then misuse this. These are radio layer attacks that allow things like denial of service and service downgrading, um, location tracking that I mentioned, um, also some form of communication interception at earlier times where, where encryption was not properly in place. Um, in terms of higher layer attacks, Um, we see, see other things that don't happen at the radio layer, but then rather at the application layer. Um, here, we, here we'll recognize things that, that, that we also see in other systems, so that's not necessarily limited to mobile or cellular networks. And then there are very different categories of attacks that are possible with that, so that's a whole, um, a whole field by itself, um, basically. Um, so let me, let me emphasize um, two contributions that we did. Um, one of the things relates to the possibilities of relay attackers. So when we look at the, the communication, how a security context is built up when a user device first connects to a base station, you have something that's called an authentication and key agreement that is executed at some point during that connection setup. Um, and there are two security modes that established. One is between the user equipment and the core network. These are the NAS, that's the NAS messages, NAS um, security mode. And the other one is protecting the communication basically between, so the wireless part between the user equipment and the, the base station. So this is what happens over the air. And then we have here typically a, um, a wired connection. Um, now, Relay attackers are attackers that, that are in between here, between the user equipment and the genome bees. And what we had in the past were kind of simple devices that were simple forwarders. So they would just take the signal and forward them. Obviously, they could eavesdrop then of, of what was being sent. Um, but mainly, it's the, so the, the legitimate purpose for them is actually boosting the signal strength. So they can also be have non attack they can be run in non attack or mode. So these were the, the, the first kind of repeated forwarders that can also then be used for, for just collecting the, the signals that are being sent. Now, um, what was possible with those is, for example, fingerprinting of, of, of activities and of, of signals that are, that are being sent because you get the signals, right? They, they can record the signals. Now, what we worked on is, um, is, a, is a different relay attacker that basically happens on a higher layer, um, namely on the Mac layer, not on the physical layer, uh, in the sense that the, uh, that the relay actually translates signals to bits, does demodulation and modulation, remodulation operations, and then um, forwards on a higher layer, basically. And what this, so when we look at the layers of the communication here, we have the physical layer communication. This is the, the simple um, repeater forwarders. Um, and what we did is we, we made our, um, our relay basically operate on, on one higher layer of the network stack. And by, and by that, be able to actually um, be able to infiltrate the system more. Um, what this allowed us to do is that we are actually able to temper with the packet, so we can change the bits because we do demodulate with that. We can recover data and possibly, as I mentioned before, impersonate users, um, as in the example with, with, with 4G traffic or also 5G where the user plane uh, traffic is not integrity protected. Um, other people have built on this um, in, in more recent work, um, bridging to 5G basically, where they try to, where um, Similar things were based on this, this relay attacker were then realized on, um, on, on, on 5G systems. And what I, um, so basically that's that kind of this type of relay attacker is, is a facilitator for, um, for, for understanding the, the capabilities of attackers. Um, the second aspect about mobile and cellular networks that I wanted to emphasize is um, when we talk about, I mentioned this, IMCs uh, are no longer used, but they are sushi. So we have encrypted versions of identifiers. 
with the goal in, four, in 5G to disable that uh, users can be tracked. That's the goal. And that's what we analyzed in, in, in more detail, um, particularly with, with Merlin cluster, who's on top there. Um, and we looked at, so how does that generally work? The device sends a registration request to the network. The network requests the identity and the device responds with the identity. And before 5G, this was not encrypted. It was not the long-term identifier, but some derived identifier from it, but it was not encrypted. So you could basically um, track users based on, on these um, identifiers that were sent. Now, a big change that was done in 5G is that something that's called SUPI concealment. Basically, the SUPI is replaced by the SUCI. And the SUCI is something that takes um, an op the operator public key into account. There's an ephemeral key, and there is the SUPI or the MC, so temporary identifier. And this is basically an, an encrypted form of the identifier. Now, what's the benefit of that is? If you m multiple times do this um, concealment operation, you get different results out of that. So when, um, when you first send the first identity response to a request, so the, the network requests the identity and the user device responds, then this first SUCI will be a different one than the second SUCI. And the network doesn't know, is this the same user or is it a different user? That's the goal of it, okay? So when we talk about Suchi catching, what can be done there? Um, so in 5G, what is not possible anymore is something that used to be possible in 4G, namely asking, who are you? We cannot do this anymore because we, we don't have this, this clear text identifiers as, as responses anymore. So if, if that's kind of the attacker, so I think this is the attacker here. But what the attacker can still do is ask for a particular identity. And I will explain why, why this is possible. So they can basically ask, are you a certain person or device or identifier? And they don't ask the name directly, but they use an old Suchi, an old Suchi that has been used before. And the devices are set up in such a way that up to a certain amount of time, they still respond positively to old Suchi requests because well, the networks are, um, that always some things can go wrong. So you need some, um, some mechanisms to um, enable communication despite of that. How can you know those old suchis? Well, you can have listened over earlier times, you have can done some yeah, called a detective work. But what is basically possible with that is the following. So the device now tries to register um, with a new suchi. And um, what the attacker does is it replaces this new suchi with an old one. And then the authentication request comes back from the network that's sent to the, to the user device. And when the user, so there are two options now, what can happen? The first thing is there's an authentication failure that's responded. So that means I don't know what this, um, what this old Suchi is basically. So it, is, it was not connected. Then you know it's somebody who was not there before. So it's not that person. But if you get an authentication response, which means that was a success, then it's a device that has previously interacted with the old Suchi. So you're still able to link basically devices uh, based on their old suchis that are that are being reused, and then you found basically you, 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 this targeted user. You are then able to re-identify. Oh, sorry. Let me just make it clear. So the suchi itself likely defeats these large-scale MC attacks. That's what I mentioned before. So you cannot just randomly ask and get all the answers of who is around. But if you want to track somebody particular. Um, and you have some previous information of what was used because you were present at a certain time before when this, when this person communicated, then you will still be able to search for that person and request information if that person is around. So the small scale or targeted user identification or localization basically still works. You can still identify them. Okay. Um, and we, well, we, evaluated, we evaluated that in the lab, um, in the lab setup, lab setup had to repeat the attack because you need to send a lot of requests. If, you don't, if you're not sure who it is, you can send a lot of requests. We did some speed testing of components. How many requests can you send? Um, are you one of those, for example, 500 people? Um, what it turned out, um, there are certain rate limits in real networks. So these are free commercial networks. Um, those experiments were done in Germany. So these are German networks, not in the UAE. Um, and we, we had certain rate limits. Um, uh, so a number of um, 
um, requests that can be done per minute. This gives us an idea about how many of those questions we can send out and how many people we can then we could then track if we have a reasonable set of, of assumptions. Okay. Any questions regarding um, regarding this this part? Feel free to interrupt me anytime. Oops. Okay. Um, so those were some of the examples of what we've worked on. Now, in terms of um, research challenges that I see, so I would like to spend two more slides on on the current research on some of the current research challenges for five G. And then also more um, in the future for 6G, whatever what I think are things that are coming. Um, so one of the things that uh, I have um, seen in the past, or I've, I've, I've not seen enough in the past, is aspects of security in the, in the core network and of the signaling protocols. That's something that's inherently difficult to do because you need a, you need a cooperation with, um, with a company, with a provider that can actually um, enable you to do things in, in most of the cases. Uh, it's, these are kind of closed systems um, and it's, it's, it's a bit hard to do things there. But there's a relatively little public research work, but it's certainly something that is interesting. Um, the second thing is, I always feel that, so there are a lot of complex interactions that are now happening because we have so many more application scenarios or applications where, where 5G is used as, as communication means. And there are questions that come up in which way we can use, for example, a situational awareness or where we can use the mobility for security purposes. Um, just by knowing where certain devices are going can be used that in order to identify when attacks are happening or can be used that information for other devices such that they can use it for verification purposes, for example. So these are aspects that I believe are, are currently still um, kind of underdeveloped or where I could, can imagine that there are interesting things to, to discover. And also trust establishment, trust establishment between parties. Um, the, the, top, the, the, the buzzword of, of zero trust. Um, I know that this, this is a topic here at TII, um, but this is um, basically because there are so many devices that are in our 5G networks increasingly also in the future connected, how we can make sure um, that, you know, how, how do we authenticate the devices? What, what are, what are the, the basics? How do the processes work exactly? Um, and these systems are large because we have, we have cloud services, we have all kinds of network functions, different providers that are all integrated within a shared infrastructure in a certain way. So this is a big topic as well. Yes. So I'm not a security expert, so I just cannot think about, uh, you know, in 5G and 6G, the tendency towards hook and run. Mm -hmm. So uh, you not have one provider. To exactly. Run with all the run. That's what I mean. The remote can right? Okay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So does this make your work more interesting or more challenging? I think there are definitely security challenges around it. So how do you build up um, a security infrastructure that supports that? Um, I mean, we know in general when we have uh, different parties that, and we want security, we know generally how to do it. We have typically key infrastructures that are want to answer to that. How do you set that up properly um, that, you know, Keys have a certain validity. How is uh, how how are they renewed? How are how how do you set up the infrastructure that you trust? That the, I have a trust system for those public keys. There are a lot of questions that make it more complicated in the future than the current systems where we have one provider uh, that can take care of all the keys for all the devices and, and the infrastructure that need to be um, that need well, to be taken uh, care of. I mean, my person might think that security challenge is proportional to the number of open nodes in case of work understanding or so that it becomes more challenging the more devices you, you have. have more more open nodes between different yeah. providers I think it, this this is um, this zero why the zero trust term became so important. It's exactly the reason for that because we can't make these trust assumptions because there are so many different parties and providers that are involved. Um, so we need to always verify and all for all the for all the actions that makes it more complicated. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a true statement. Yeah. And, uh, so yes. Yeah. Yes. How do you see these uh, challenges? Towards 6G security? Does, that, yeah, ten, yeah that, th this is 10 years. 5G, we are just, I mean, typically these, um, these mobile systems have a 10 year um, core time. So they, they typically operate over 30 years, um, but typically there's a core time and then it's transitioning to the next system. So 10 years into the future, I think we will be exactly at the point of rolling out 6G. 
Um, so three ideas of what I think we will be working on on six sheet security. And of course that's speculative. Um, what I see my colleagues and other people working on in terms of wireless communication is like intelligent radios that automatically kind of adjust, adapt um, distributed systems that, um, yeah, that, that, that will be increasingly based on, on AI mechanisms. They need to learn from the environment, they need to sense, they need to build logic based on that. So all the attacks that we currently know and that might also still be discovered in the future <laughs> on all kinds of AI and ML system, like, like vectors, injection, um, 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 uh, poisoning attacks, all of those attacks are, are something that we will have to, to consider in, in mobile networks as well in the future, because I expect AI and ML to have an increasing importance for the, for the new generation um, that's going to come partly maybe in 5G already, but certainly in 6G. So that's one aspect. The second thing is, uh, is this tendency that we already start to see now, um, where, where the different networks are not considered only in, um, individually anymore, but increasingly looking for solutions that integrate them into a, a, larger, a larger infrastructure. So we talk about systems that are called um, SECIN or sex, SECSINs, um, which stands for space, um, um, aerial, um, SAG, ground integrated networks, possibly including with C, as you see on the, so the, the maritime, maritime side on the picture here. So the idea is that you have systems that with 6G communication integrate all of those systems together. So if you maybe you're on the ground, your wireless connection breaks, so your Wi-Fi breaks for whatever reasons, then you're able to go via the space link, for example, or something that's then supported by maritime uh, links. So all of that in a larger infrastructure <laughs> And this, I mean, I cannot assume that this can be developed without introducing new vulnerabilities because all of those systems themselves have already vulnerabilities. And when you put those all together, um, I, I'm pretty sure that there will be, I mean, we will have to work on, on solutions for making these larger systems operate um, um, in, a, in a secure manner, as secure as we can. We never get 100% security anyways, but um, that's yeah the goal. And the third thing, and that's going to come probably earlier than 10 years in the future. Um, quantum computers and the advances on... So currently we have um, the, 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 the algorithms that are implemented are like AES, right? AES is vulnerable to quantum attacks. So when we have quantum computers, then those are not secure anymore. So we need um, the, the development, but also then the inclusion of those post-quantum algorithms in, um, in, in the networks as well. So what I mean, first, what I mean by boundaries, like the, the connections between the systems and, okay, the new vulnerabilities, maybe that's, I don't know if it's the best formulation, but what I mean is when you, when you have two components, you have two systems and you put them together, there will be new things like this. When you think about already cross-layer attacks, so typically, Simple example: When we the 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 layers of the the network stack have often been individually analyzed in terms of security, um, but when you look at cross-layer attacks that cross those network layers, more things become possible, more attacks become possible. And in a similar manner, I assume that when you when you have these complex systems, and those are complex. I mean, here the, the picture is very simple, but when you have an entire maritime or space network. Um, and you put them then together and you try to integrate them and have both way communication between them, there will be new things that, that, um, that become risky, yeah. let me put it that yeah. way. Our research group had an experience of, uh, of finding uh, software in uh, communication, AMIT, for example. It's not the like a the famous one that was in communication, uh -huh. right? And uh, so then <laughs> when you connect a bunch of devices together and then in the broker, you start the connection to define the broker, mm -hmm. and then the data structure. So you have a, a concurrent software, right? So you have several threads right. running right. parallel communication, right? Right. And then you can find the yeah, real, real uh, databases in our fields. Yes. Yeah. 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 So here, I mean, in addition, I mean, to the three layers of say, I mean, for I was mentioned about that like application and that type of layers, you are also. Uh, and 
of these systems. Yeah, no, no, the oh. security system within such exchanges. It's going to be challenging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's um. for sure. But you mentioned GPS already, right? Um, yeah. And that, that nicely brings me actually, um, and maybe I jump over this over this slide here um, to talk about it, but that actually brings me nicely the connection to, to the second part uh, in terms of secure localization and aviation. That's um, a second focus that we are working on. Um, and I, I mean, when we look at, when I talk about cybersecurity, civil aviation, there are a number of topics, but what is interesting basically to us is that side here, so security within the aircraft, and then in particular for the communication between aircraft and from aircraft to base stations on the ground and from other like um, UAVs, for example, drones that fly to the ground and the network. So basically these are, these are a topic of interest to, to our group. Um, we have in the past focused on, on two systems, um, GPS and GPS security, as well as um, the ADSB system. So the, um, um, uh, the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast that is used, it has become mandatory, I think in 2020 in, in larger parts of the world. Um, and that gives some, so communication directly between airplanes that are flying and in particular between airplanes and the ground. Um, and, and helps things like, like separation from other devices, situational awareness, so that the ground know increasingly, not only based on radar, but also on other, on, on ADSB technique, where the, where the airplanes are and uh, can, can survey basically the, the airspace better. And in terms of the systems, so the technical systems, um, there, there are some differences here. Some things are similar, but some things are definitely different. In terms of GPS, we need the connection to four satellites at least. Um, and then based on the times of arrival, so the, the signal travel times, um, these devices calculate their position. So there are basically four equations and we have four parameters or four variables that have to be calculated, longitude, latitude, and, and the altitude plus the timing. And uh, so we have these four parameters, we have four equations, and then and can calculate basically the, the location of, of our receiving devices. Now what makes these difficult to secure. I mean, we know for 15 years at least that GPS is not secure uh, or can easily be attacked. So you can easily send false spoofed signals um, and those devices will then believe to be somewhere else or have a different time um, um, when they time synchronize. Um, they are inherently difficult to secure because what is difficult to secure is, is it's based on signal arrival times and signal arrival times are hard to secure. Um, there have been some works that may make me um, say that with a little bit less confidence, as I said, two or three years ago. Uh, but in general, we can very well secure data because we encrypt them. We know how to do that. We, we know which security levels we get by that. But protecting, we can generally not cryptographically protect um, signal arrival times. Um, so that means that every, anybody who's on the way here can replay that signal, even if they are not able to decrypt it. Um, in the case of, of GPS, it's not even the case because the signals are not encrypted. So they are, there's no encryption on the signals. Um, and why is there no, no decryption? Because it's an open infrastructure. So anybody on ground can put up a device and, and receive those signals, basically. The situation is a little bit different with ADSB. Um, but again, we, we have the communication between airplanes. We have the communication from airplanes to ground stations where data like the GPS locations, so the locations of those planes, as well as timestamps, as well as some other parameters are sent. Um, there, there's been a lot of public use for that. So I'm sure you have seen um, flight radar um, showings um, or, or other systems, radar cape, open sky networks that, that have networks on the ground sensor network that collect those signals that are being sent out and then can then in real time live show all the, all the airplanes that are flying. Um, what makes those systems difficult to secure is a different thing. It's actually the slow um, regulatory processes in the aviation industry. So we would know how to make these systems secure. We could put up um, keys, we could put up infrastructures to authenticate and to um, possibly also encrypt the messages. Um, but there are, again, there are also diff very different partners involved. So it's not a national thing only. It's not one company only that is involved. And also in the entire aviation industry is, is slowly moving. So when you do changes there, that, that takes a lot of time. So those systems are also insecure. And we, um, we considered both. We looked at um, both. Uh, just one, one example here for um, attackers about how much 
change I've seen over the years, a couple of, um, so maybe like almost 20 years ago, you needed very high cost, special purpose hardware if you wanted to be an attacker on those systems and send fake GPS signals. When I started working on it, um, we, could, we would use GPS satellite simulators that were, were still reasonably expensive, uh, pretty expensive I found at that time. Um, but you needed those special purpose devices in order to be an attacker basically and send fake signals. Nowadays we have software to find radios and here are, I'm still using some of them, the pictures from a couple of years ago. They are now small, like a, like a USB stick they can be, right? So you have um, radio, um, RF devices um, that can send out signals. We have the software that is available. So it's very easy to do now. Um, and that has led, okay, let me point out one thing here. There are different categorizations of different types of attacks that are, that are possible. One is a pinpoint spoofing attack where the attacker would send out a fake signal and this would simply result in the receiving device, antenna, wherever it is, to be at a different location. Also physically, it is still here, would believe to be somewhere else. And then we have a more, um, a category of a more challenging type of attacks, which are the coordinated spoofing attacks, where you would have multiple senders that have to coordinate because as soon as one, uh, one sender sends out signals that are received from the same devices, they will believe to be at the same wrong location. So because they receive the same signals, they are, if you have multiple signals here overlaid, those four satellite signals that we need in order to run GPS, they would, for example, all believe to be at the same wrong location. And that's something that you could easily identify. For an attacker to be more sophisticated, you would have a setup that um, uses, for example, directional antennas and, and makes use of way more sophisticated techniques in order to successfully spoof a, sy a system such that it becomes hard to detect. That's just a mention about different attacker strengths and scenarios that are being considered. Does it happen in reality? It does. <laughs> The first example here is, a, um, is, a, is still a lab example, although it was done in the real world, but it was researchers, researchers in 2013 who did it for the first time um, to spoof a yacht. Um, later on, we've seen a number of real world examples that happened over time where we see GPS spoofing attacks taking place and, and there are increasingly reports, as a, there's a long list by now. Um, so we know that it is well feasible to conduct GPS spoofing attacks and uh, make location time calculations vulnerable. So one of the things that we looked into, and just have a look at the timing. Okay, um, we looked at is um, how can we how can we detect those attacks, and what else can we kind of learn about systems? If I have time, I will also go into some um, ADSB attacks, but I might actually might might skip or make this part shorter um, because of the time. But let's start looking at this GPS spoofing system here. Uh, that's joint work with a, with a number of collaborators. Um, so when you when you look at the the entire system, the the, the GPS system, um, what we the, our our one of the goals was um, that we wanted to be able um, basically in a combined system. So I mentioned that ADSB is using GPS. It's one of the so GPS is, uh, is used on the aircraft to determine the location at a certain moment in time. And then the locations and timestamps that are determined by that are sent out in the ADSB messages. So we have a natural link between GPS and ADSB. They are integrated, they are put together. And we were, our goal was to actually detect um, GPS spoofing attack when they are happening in, in, an, in an aircraft context. And the, the step that we went beyond out of the work in particular during that time was that we, we used that information to localize the attacker or to gain information where the attacker is actually located. And I'll show you the idea of that. And the second thing, more recent work that we are still um, extending. So we are, this is a topic we are still working on right now is um, GPS spoofing detection on UAVs with um, other channels, so not based on GPS only, but here in particular using image matching. So we make use of the camera that is installed on the devices to verify uh, claims about locations and to use it to, to identify locations in case of, of, of GPS jamming, where we wouldn't have any information from GPS basically. Let me give you the idea of that, um, of that first thing here. So we use the following idea. We have a number of, we have a ground setup and infrastructure that collects ADSB signals. We have aircraft that fly, that send out signals. And we have a spoofer that tries to um, interfere with the system by sending wrong locations to the aircraft. Um, 
that means then that these wrong locations are forwarded to our ground infrastructure and we can collect that information here, right? So what we were working on is um, we wanted to be able to identify that those attacks were happening and then also get information about where the spoofer is located such that other countermeasures could be taken to stop, to stop those attacks from happening, basically. In our research, we used um, data from the Open Sky Network. So we were working on real world data um, that's like Radar Scape. That's, that's a, it's a research um, consortium that um, allows, allowed us to, to make use basically of, of real world data for, for those purposes. And let me give you the idea. So for spoofing detection, there are two ways of how we can attack that. When we have, um, so we have not only GPS that is, is being in use for localizing um, aircraft, but there are also other techniques, in particular model alteration is one technique that is used, where you would have foreground infrastructures um, and that communicate with the aircraft and based on those uh, arrival times uh, are able to locate the, the, the aircraft. So if whatever is reported in the, ADSB mess in the ADSB messages is not the same or close enough to what, what another system tells us, that's kind of a cross check. That's an indication of a spoofing attack. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Another idea is if two different aircraft are actually reporting a location that's very close, too close than it can be in reality, then this is another indication. And that's exactly the idea when you have one antenna and you, you they reach, so the fake signals reach both aircraft, they will think they are at the same wrong location. So that's a more interesting case here from my perspective, from a research perspective of identifying those attacks. Now, in terms of local, localizing the attacker, we went a step further and just the rough idea. So we have the attacker that sends out signals and those signals arrive at those aircraft at a different point in time. So, it will be a little bit earlier on the first aircraft and a little bit later on the second aircraft because the paths are longer, right? That means these two aircraft on this, if you think, can imagine that this is the spoofed aircraft track, so that's what, what the attacker tries to imply, then they will turn up at different locations on those tracks. The one where the signals arrive earlier will believe to be a bit further, and the one who receives it later will be thinking it's a little bit behind on that track. What we do, and I will give you the, the idea on the next slide in a little bit more detail, we use multilateration, we turn around the multilateration problem. So we don't multilaterate on the aircraft to localize them, but we basically use these signal arrival times that indicate different times on our track here to be able to localize the spoofer. So the jamming device that sends out those fake signals. And then the uh, simulations and some on, based on the real world data that we have to show that. So let me just show you the idea um, shortly. When you have normal aircraft multilateration, you have multiple sensors based on those signal arrival times. You're able to um, basically have a hyperbole or in, in, three, in, in 3D, it's a hyperboloid. And then you know um, it, this aircraft must be somewhere on this, on this hyperbole here or, the, or a hyperboloid. When you, when you use more sensors in that system, you get additional equations with more hyperboloids, and then they will all intersect at one point. And that's basically the location of the aircraft. Um, what happens in this GPS spoofing case is we make use of a similar idea, but we turn it around. So here it's about the distances between spoofer and aircraft. Um, it ends up at different points on those spoofed aircraft track. And what we are able to do now is we're using those, those distances or those times of arrival of those signals here, again, with multiple aircraft and do the same um, building of hyperboles of where the attacker can actually be. So we can formulate that in a number of, um, of, of equations. When we have at least three or four aircraft, then we can basically localize the, the attacker by that. Um, so we did some simulations and showed that the faster the aircraft are, the better, the more precision you get and so on. So that's, um, that's uh, the, the, some more investigation there. But what I found my, the most interesting about this aspect of this research work is that we basically, we flipped this problem of multilateration instead of localizing the aircraft, we localize the attacker by a similar technique, making use of, of, of this multilateration idea for um, localizing aircraft and we use it for, for the attacker. Um, this 
Interestingly, also works without line of sight communication. So you don't have, need to have a line of sight communication between the recording infrastructure, so the sensors on ground, and the attacker that is spoofing the aircraft. You don't need this because you have the ADSB messages that relay that information. Um, that, let, let, me, let me stop here regarding this. Um, two slides regarding DeepSim. Um, so I mentioned using a separate channel to identify GPS spoofing attack when you do that on drones. The idea here is um, we can, on one hand, we have satellite imagery, Google Earth, for example, other systems as well. So we get satellite images. We can know when, when a certain device thinks it's at a certain location, then it sh we should be able to verify that with the satellite imagery that's available. So they take pictures, they use GPS to locate themselves, and we can basically verify and check is the claimed location by this aerial photo at the real location that, that the satellite imagery uh, indicates. So that's actually an image processing problem. Um, we have a, a learning model where we input basically the satellite images and then the aerial photos, and then have a spoofing indicator. So that's a, a binary decision problem. Is it, is it yes, is spoofing happening or not? Or in other words, is the location that was claimed, um, is it really the one where, where, the, where the drone is or, or is it not? And um, we did that with, um, with some, some, some deep learning um, um, algorithms, um, looking at basically our indicators here. We have two ways of doing that, doing that on the ground where the aircraft sends results to the ground or doing it on board with, with different types of results here. And um, there's some, some caveats. So in general, it works pretty well. So those numbers here indicate that it works pretty well, but it will obviously work only pretty well if you have feature rich landscape. So if you do that uh, over a city, this will work pretty well. If you do it over the desert or over the ocean, you don't have enough features in the landscape. So for those systems or for those areas, it, it will not work so well. Um, but what is generally interesting about that is, and, and, and that's what I, what I like and what we keep on working about it is that you don't need to restrict it for only to use this idea for GPS spoofing detection. So not only for detecting if an attack is taking place, but you can actually try to use that as well the same idea to, if you know that you're being spoofed or if you're being jammed and you don't have any indication of where you are, if you know at least the broad area where you are, you can use the satellite imagery for then detecting where you really are. So basically using it for localization. And that's, that's something we are currently still working on. Now we are, the, the, the one hour is over and we start a bit late. Um, do you want me to stop at that point or go to my concluding slides or do I have a couple of more minutes to, um, what, five, yeah, five more minutes. <clears throat> let me still jump over a few slides um, and let me go just to the third part of the talk. If it's a, a different context, a different setup, uh, and um, just something that, that, that's interesting to listen to, I think. Um, so on the, on the third topic, on anonymity and privacy, um, we, we have the following observation, and this is a work um, mainly done by, by Theodore. It's something that will be presented at NDSS in, um, in, in February next year, or this year, sorry, we're on 2023 already. Um, so this year, next month. Um, and the idea here is that when you, when you think of your messenger applications, what you typically, so WhatsApp, Signal, Prima, whatever you're using, um, a sender is sending a message to a certain receiver and this is being forwarded to a messenger, messenger server. So there's a server infrastructure behind that. that forwards that to the receiver and then the receiver, oh, basically the, the messenger server first indicates typically that the message has been forwarded to the receiver. So you get one check mark or there may be different indications in different system, but uh, in some of them, it's one check mark. And then at the moment when the receiver has read it, it also confirms that and sends them back to the messenger server that then forwards it to the sender. And then we get these two check marks. So we know that a person has read something, right? So what we observed is that um, at different locations, maybe that's not surprising, but at different locations, there are different timings that it takes for those responses to come back. So if the receiver is, um, uh, is located in a close by city that's also close to the messenger server, these round trip times will be much shorter than if you say um, the receiver is located on a different, in a different country, in a different continent with a, with a certain um, distance. So we did a number of, um, 
of, uh, of tests. Have some, we started off with, with a sender that's, um, that's in Bochum. We, used, we, we figured out where those servers are for different infrastructures. Some of them was in Düsseldorf, another city in Germany. And then we looked at how, how long, how are those timings, these round trip timings, how do they reflect? And we, we observed if we, if we stay within the same city, then it's something usually among one millisecond. Um, if we send it to Abu Dhabi, where we had the, the other side of the, the infrastructure, it was like 15 milliseconds. So it's a, a considerable difference, right? So the question that we asked is, can we actually use this, this timing information as a side channel to identify or to, to extract information about where a certain receiver is located without that receiver noticing, because it's just the normal operation of the system, right? Imagine you send messages with, with one of your friends, your colleagues, family members, uh, you would have a way to identify if or confirm that if they are at a certain location or actually not. And we just, so this was an experimental work that we did. We looked at how the system are, how the systems are built, which, which protocols, which, mes which messages are involved. Um, and to spend one, one, one moment about the threat model. So um, what we need the attacker to do is it's just using a regular Android device with being, having the capability to record those timings of um, how long things take. Um, it, they need to be able to capture their own network traffic. Um, and one of the things that, that we had to give into the attacker is basically the, the attacker and the um, victim need to be in each other's contact list which may be a limiting aspect of an attacker model. Um, in Germany, I, I would be very difficult. Uh, I would be very, how would I say? Um, um, uh, I think it, it's a strong restriction in some way because I would only use Messenger with people that are very close to me in a certain way. I feel here in the UAE where WhatsApp is used like all over the place. There's no, I mean, do you know all the people that are on your contact lists on, on WhatsApp? You've, I mean, I've communicated with so many people, I don't even know who they are. So I feel this is a more realistic attacker model actually in the UAE than, than in other parts of the world. Um, and what we basically did is we, we, we sent messages, we, we collect this data, we iterate through different setups, um, we repeated that collect the data, um, had yeah, different types of setups. Um, one, in the first round, we had fixed locations, we had used Wi-Fi only, and we had basically only a country level, tried to identify between Germany, Greece, and, um, and the UAE, can we identify that? And we could do that pretty well. And the second stage, which is maybe more interesting, is what we looked at the city level. So can we identify that the person is located in that area or in another area, which is more realistic? Is a person really at work or are they at home? Things like that. Um, we used uh, Wi-Fi and mobile data um, and rotated devices so that we didn't have a dependency on the devices anymore. So that was uh, the whole experimental setup. And the results that we got, um, it was in that case interesting that um, so time versus distance, so the timing would not directly tell us the distance. So this, my first assumption was that we would get the distance as outcome. And because it's about round, round trip times and you think it directly relates to the distances, but this didn't work very well. So we had kind of quite some, some variance in those results. But what worked better, also it does not necessarily nicely show that on this graph, but what worked actually much better, much better is um, the time to the, the round trip times versus the different locations. So it's not really a localization system that the attacker gets, but it's a, a classification by which an attacker can verify is a certain user at one of a set of locations or not where, where data was pre-recorded. So it's actually, um, so, so based on previously record, recorded data, which the attacker has because there have been previous interactions, an attacker can kind of reliably, and I come to the reliability numbers in a moment, identify um, how, how good that works. So we had like, again, a learning system behind that. Um, um, we, yeah, we used different, it's different classification tasks that we went into. Um, let me spare you with the details, but let's look at the results in terms of figuring out the country in which a receiver is for the different, the three different messages here. So Signal, Threema and WhatsApp, um, we got something between 74 and 84 uh, percent of precision of among those four different countries. We had four countries, uh, UAE, Germany, Greece, and Netherlands. Um, those were the per those percentages and in, in correctness of the, the, the estimate where a certain user is. Um, we had further results um, regarding um, basically the devices at a certain location where we used um, where we used more receiving phones. We had multiple, in, in that case, three or four locations within 
Um, that was within a city, so it was within a smaller context, as I said, this is the second set as experiments. Um, and we also used it the network connection. So can we identify somebody on Wi-Fi or do they use the, their, their, mobile, their mobile communication? And that worked surprisingly reliably in a, in a lot number of cases, except for um, signal in the UAE. And here I think that some filtering and restrictions for signal in the UAE um, get in. So we could actually see that in the data. I'm almost done. Countermeasures. Um, countermeasures, uh, what is kind of maybe an, an obvious thing, but what we could do is introduce some random delays in that so that the responses, the confirmations are not sent instantaneously, but there's some random delay. Would that harm users? Well, the messages would still be received in time, so there's no delay on that. You just get the confirmation a little bit later. Up to a certain level, I feel that would be something that is, could be um, accepted by users. Um, we found that in our experiments, up, like five seconds is something that would already be good enough that we cannot distinguish it from, from random um, um, from, from random uh, timings here anymore. So if, uh, if we add up to five seconds of random delays, we cannot distinguish different locations or, or connections anymore. Um, of course, if we disable delivery confirmations at all, this would entirely prevent the attack, but that's not very user-friendly. So I understand if, if the, the apps do not want to implement that, that would be the, the easiest countermeasure. We reached out to, um, as I mentioned, Signal, WhatsApp, and Threema with different kind of reactions. Uh, um, some of them were very responsive and they explored it themselves. They are considering at least giving users the option now for enabling things or adding some delays to that. So that's a kind of currently going on and I, I hope we will further hear back from them what, what they decide to do with that. WhatsApp wasn't, uh, WhatsApp and, uh, wasn't very responsive to that. So they were not very responsive to the idea mainly for, for the reason of, so, so Threema, is, Threema and Signal are both apps that are, are systems that, um, that are proud of their security and privacy features that they provide. So for them, it's, I guess, more important than it is for WhatsApp, um, where, where this is not at the, at the forefront of the selling point, basically, of the apps. With that, I come to the conclusion, sorry for, taking, for, for keeping you here a couple of minutes longer than I, than I planned. Um, our research work, we, we have these three main areas that I talked to you about, mobile cellular network security, secure localization, aviation, and uh, different aspects of anonymity and privacy in internet um, systems. We've also kind of recently started on, on some other topics. So I'm just mentioning it in case you are working or some, or some of you are working on similar things and you want to connect. Um, we've started to work on mis and disinformation campaigns and how to detect them. That's also an NDSS paper that, that will come up, um, will come out next month. Um, and some, some security and privacy issues in, in large scale language models. A lot of people are working that nowadays. Um, so that's maybe not surprising, but just one, wanted to mention that. Um, I'm generally interested in, in collaboration. So if things come to your mind where you would like to connect further, um, just reach out to me. I'm happy to, um, to interact more and tell you more and uh, we could see what we could possibly also do together. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's been my pleasure to be here. Research here is that uh, of the security of real and newer uh, distributed systems. Yeah. Okay? And uh, you have applied uh, techniques in the domain of radiation and mysteries. What about autonomous vehicles? Did you try to look at uh, security of autonomous vehicles because you have many processors in the car that they connect by a gun, for example, right? And then you have the problems of encryption with the gun. Yeah. Uh, so can you give us a few words about that domain? Or yeah. So I think in, in some aspect, there are a lot of overlaps when we look at like security of UAVs and security of autonomous vehicles. There are some things that are very similar from the systems. There, there's mobility, they need, uh, they need communication, wireless communication channels, you need key setups, whatever. There are many things that are similar. I've not particularly gone into um, autonomous on-ground systems. So I'm not really sure. So I'm just thinking like uh, live now with you, what could yeah. be particular questions that are indistinct in those systems. Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of vehicular networks, I'm thinking that the, the, the infrastructure is somehow di different. We are talking about um, these on-site units at the street at very well-defined locations, which is different maybe than a more ad hoc distributed 
sensor infrastructure that collects those aviation signals. Um, so I could imagine that there are some differences in the way the systems are, are built that have some impact, but I think the, the general approach and methods and techniques are probably very similar in terms of doing research in those areas. That would be my, my, my feeling, yeah. And uh, what about GPS spookies? It's, it's quite a known attack, right? So it's still a problem uh, in the field. The interesting thing is that, as I mentioned, this is like has been there for 15, 20 yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, and there have been a lot of proposals, some using out of band channels, some um, looking at like the, the directionality of from where signals arrive. So for satellites, you know, they need to come from some from a certain constellation from up there. Right. Um, there have been some um, some proposals that go more into the kind of uh, the signals and the signal basically detecting i mean first first ideas were about doppler shifts but then there were some other more more sophisticated approaches as well but what i find interesting that i in real world deployed systems or, or, or modules that you can buy none of them is integrated till now and i i wonder why this is the case actually because i i think I think there, are, there have been proposals that to me sound kind of reasonably convincing to at least make it much, much harder for an attacker. I don't want to say that you can 100% prevent it, but to make attacks way, way harder than they are still now. Um, but I don't see it implemented. I don't see it in the real world systems so far. And it, this is a bit, it's actually a bit surprising to me. Yeah. Yeah, and then my last comment about the presentation. So you have uh, shown other research directions. <laughs> And then we have lots of uh, AI models, right? Yeah. And uh, today we have just uh, started a project, I think it's with the same university, right? Uh, it's the same university. The same university, yes. right? So <laughs> Dave, uh, Sam, you can see some yeah. coverage of 6G, right? Secured yeah. AI model, right? Yeah. And then also, it's you know, yeah, he, like Shafiq has the office two yeah. or three next to mine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I just left before yeah. you came. Yeah. He was here before. Yeah. Oh, I, really? I didn't know. <laughs> I said, What's yeah. happening? Yeah. We, we should have yeah. coordinated. Yeah. But I, I, to, just to be fair, I, was, I wasn't at NYU for three days. I was at a workshop I, where I come yeah. from directly. So, that's yeah. why I guess um, we didn't interact. Yeah. So I didn't know. Uh, one question I mean, um, I mean, regarding what you mentioned, I mean, for uh, the side channel attacks for other application layer, is there any uh, difference? Like policies or countermeasures that have been identified Which side? developed, like for the side channel attacks, we were like talking about the time characterization for the different application before. Are you talking about uh, GPS now, or are you no, talking after, about the... I mean, the application layer for for, for the for network? Side channel one, side channel attacks. Time uh, one call, sorry, and so on. Oh, the, the last part. Yeah, sorry, yes, part, that, yeah. okay, okay, no, no, yeah. Now, can you ask your question again? I was in the wrong, yeah, was in the mean, wrong area. Is there any like uh, defenses and um, uh, policies or countermeasures that has been implemented for such attacks? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we reached out. We reached out with our suggestions. I mean, as I said, the, the easiest but also dumbest suggestion is just to disable the confirmations. But that's not very user friendly. So people like to have it. I like to see when somebody has read right. So that's not going to happen. Um, introducing some form of delays. I think it's something that is reasonable. We can talk about how long those delays are, how long they need to be. Maybe it's just a few seconds. Maybe it's, you know, maybe you can optimize something that's even less. Um, but I think that's kind of reasonable, at least for people who, who do care about the privacy when they're using those apps, then they should have a way to enable maybe this, this, this option of having delays introduced, which make this attack not possible anymore. I would say it's not possible anymore. Um, so the, as I said, so, so three ma, um, for whom like security and privacy is a very important selling point, marketing point, they responded very, um, very favorably, I would say. So they, have, um, they came back to us that they are doing um, own experiments on that and they are evaluating that. And, and so, yeah, that, that was a good, a good interaction with them. Great. I think also, uh, the, the time, also Andres, we are going to discuss it. I mean, because we see this at other application, they are of IoT, uh, network, I mean, given the IoT uh -huh. paradigm has been defined, uh -huh. uh, maybe we can have some discussions later on regarding this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Any other questions, maybe? I think Saeed, you are interested on side channel attacks, and by chance we talked about this this morning <laughs> pertaining to some uh, power analysis. Okay. And uh, yeah.
anyway, so uh, later on, I mean, we are going to synchronize and keep Christina maybe posted about our thoughts and and kind of matching. Thank you so much again. I think Pleasure. online uh, it was quite clear. Uh, there is no questions. We would like to thank you again. And uh, thank you. Uh,